I'd like to now introduce Emily. Uh, she is a researcher, author, and art lover based in Seattle. Her background is in art history, archaeology, and museology, um, which inform her approach to modern and contemporary art, illustration, design, folk art, craft, and what it means to be an artist today like the other um, people on um, our program. Aside from being the author of Almost Lost Arts, she's also the author of The Art of Beatrix Potter, which I love Beatrix Potter, um, and works by day in book publishing when she's not doing all that other stuff. Um, so it's now my pleasure to bring Emily up to the podium, and she will introduce our speakers and the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm Emily Friedrich. I'm the author of Almost Lost Arts. I am so honored to be here this evening with the Harvard Museums for Science and Culture and the Peabody Museum. Thank you for having us to celebrate this book. And thank you all for joining us, um, braving the impending bomb cyclone. So thank you, uh, Bostonites, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for everyone who's tuning in on the live stream. Um, hi to everyone at home. <laughs> uh, I won't lie, I'm pretty over the moon about this. This is all really exciting. Uh, it's really great to be here. And it's so fitting that we're here with the Peabody, which is an institution for the study of humans, um, our ancient history and our culture. And it's all for a book that explores those art forms, techniques and technologies that often have roots that go back hundreds and even thousands of years. I can get through some of my slides here. Um, there is evidence that Neolithic peoples in Cyprus had sophisticated weaving technology even 9,000 years ago. Julia Strayu, the Cypriot weaver profiled in this book, is one of the few weavers today who carries on these traditions that were passed down to her by the weavers before her um, and teaches them to the new generations. Or the thousand-year-old practice of New Mexico's few Anharadora. Anharadora is literally plasterous in the adobe tradition. And Anita Rodriguez has imparted this knowledge to Joanna Keen Lopez, just as generations of Indo-Hispanic women before them passed it down to each other, and the ancestral Pueblo before them passed it down from woman to woman and person to person. For these women, the weight of that history, of what once was, of what they are holding on to, and what they have brought back, is felt every time they go to the old places to source their clay and mud. It's felt every time they mix the adobe or every time they prepare the clay slip paint and the materials they use to make and maintain vessels for living. I also talked to Porfirio Gutierrez, who is here recently. Um, he and his family it, uh, are from Teotitlan de Valle in Oaxaca, and they have revived the Zapotec techniques for indigenous plants to make their vivid dyes. Um, seen on this book cover, and uh, many of those recipes go back to pre-Columbian times before the Spanish. Their beautiful rugs and textiles are woven into patterns of power that call back to the ruins of Mitla, a nearby Zapotec site. And their work has also greatly reduced the use of synthetic dyes by others, other weaver and dyer uh, families in their community that everyone saw was poisoning their homes. For the 22 features in this book, I talk to artists and artisans all over the world, sometimes traveling or by phone or email or Skype, and um, any way that worked for uh, me to learn more about their work. For example, in London, Peter Bellerby searched for two years to find a, the perfect bespoke globe uh, that he dreamed of as a gift for his father's 80th birthday, but no option satisfied him, so he made it himself and founded Bellerby and Company Globe Makers or in Italy, where I talked to the Fonderia Artistica Battaglia Milano, which is the oldest bronze foundry in Italy. It has survived wars and a century of upheaval and social change and continues to be one of the world's premier foundries for the lost wax method of bronze casting. Or in Japan, where fewer artisans are certified in the traditional arts each year as young people pursue other careers that don't require decades of apprenticeship and time. 
But Muneyake Shimode is a third generation kintsugi shi in Japan. He and his father practiced the makie, or lacquer arts. And kintsugi, which means golden joinery, is one of the most beautiful of them. And this is the technique by which ceramics are repaired using rice lacquer and gold powder so that the pieces, when repaired, are more beautiful than before they were broken. You can see the gold lines on that piece he's repairing. Through a translator, I also interviewed ceramicist Lee Eon Bum in Korea, who practices Goryeo Celadon in much the same way as the unique Korean Celadon tradition has been practiced for centuries. Uh, but he creates modern forms and fresh designs that reflect his ideas as a contemporary Korean artist. Or in my hometown in Seattle, I talked to Brittany Nicole Cox, one of two people in North America with a master's degree in antiquarian horology, the study of time. She specializes in restoring 17th century timepieces, as well as exquisite automatons, like singing birds that you see here, and 100-year-old music boxes. I also spoke with incredibly devoted wet plate photographers in Portland and one in Tennessee, Giles Clement, seen here, uh, known for his huge ambrotype portraits of everyday people, jazz musicians, and the occasional celebrity. All very devoted and talented artists. Um, and many of them are following their birthright or heritage, and others have sought out their practice. All have studied and apprenticed and taken a long time to earn their skill set. They all draw on the deep past every time they start a new day of work. Certainly, our way back ancestors didn't have neon signs, like those produced by Jeff Friedman's team at Let There Be Neon in New York, um, or whose vintage signs uh, they lend a hand to restore in Cuba through their work with Habana Light. You might also have seen the National Audio Company in Springfield, Missouri, in the news this week as the only remaining manufacturers of cassette tapes, the shortage of ferric oxide, which is a key ingredient to creating the professional audio recording tape, um, seemed to threaten their production. But good news, just this morning on their Instagram, they confirmed that they received 11 tons of it and they are back on track. So don't worry, indie bands, you'll get your cassette tapes. So you see that if you start to peel back the layers even a little bit, there are so many stories, and not one is less interesting than the last. This was the most compelling part about working on this book, collecting the human stories that are bound to these practices and that are remnants of our cultural inheritance. Stories that show what these artists create or mend or preserve enriches our communities, but we can only see them if we know that they are there. So I wrote this book to shine a spotlight on a few of them and so that hopefully we will start to see these makers among our own neighbors, and so that we can offer them our support as they offer their work and their art to us. I'm excited for you to hear from some of them tonight. So we're going to take a few moments to turn over the stage here, and then we'll engage in our discussion. Um, I will introduce them before we do so. Um, first, I have Boston's own sign painting duo, Meredith Kasabian and Josh Luke, Best Dressed Signs, joining us. Their incredible work shown here. Harvard's own Narian Kondekar, the director of the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies, senior conservation scientist, and also the curator for the Forbes Pigment Collection and the Gettens Collection of Binding Media and Varnishes here at Harvard Art Museums. Incredible collection that I got to preview this morning. Amazing. Uh, last but not least, uh, as an expiring calligrapher myself, I am really excited um, for the author of The Art of the Handwritten Note and calligrapher Margaret Shepard to join us as well. Thank you for taking the time to be here and most of all for contributing to this book and for sharing your work and experiences and expertise with me. It means so much and it's all come together to create such a beautiful finished book and I'm just really happy that you're here. <laughs> um, I'd like to just dive right in. Um, so I wanna give you each a moment to talk about what you do and what first drew you to that work, um, kind of in your own words. Margaret, maybe we can start with you. Your essay was so beautiful um, about your, it was sort of your personal love letter to calligraphy and handwriting. Um, I've done calligraphy all my adult life. In fact, I think 
I've been motivated to do it ever since I flunked it in third grade. <laughs> if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I've written 18 books, mainly for beginners, to encourage them to pick up a pen. I've also freelanced, designed book covers, retirement citations, memorial plaques, you name it, I've done it. If you went to MIT during the 80s and 90s, I wrote your diploma. <laughs> <laughs> but mainly, I love the way the letters look. I love how it feels to write them, day after day, hour after hour. And I like sharing that with people so that they can communicate better and feel better about their words. It's beautiful. And you're stubborn, too, I guess, if you flunked that third grade calligraphy or <laughs> cursive class. Yeah. What, br what brought you back to it? Margaret, I'm what sorry. brought you back to calligraphy after you flunked cursive? I knew there had to be a better way. <laughs> and I think maybe a lot of people felt that way, but I trusted it. And I, that's what I encourage people to do. Trust your feeling about how your words look and how it feels to write them. It's really beautiful. Um, I'd like to hear from Josh next, actually. Josh, you had such a great experience that you shared with me about the first time you really noticed a hand-painted sign. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and more of your background? Um, yes, I, I'll try to be uh, brief because um, I tend, tend to mumble and ramble, but uh, <laughs> I'll try my best. But first of all, um, thank you so much for having us in your book. It's absolutely beautiful. And when we looked through it, we were just so amazed at all of the um, uh, incredible talent in that book. And if you guys haven't seen it yet, uh, you will soon. And it's, it's, inc it's incredible. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Josh. you. Um, <laughs> the first time I was working, um, I was working at an uh, art store, actually, in uh, downtown San Francisco. And sort of like um, I had actually just, I had recently graduated um, from art school and I was sort of like didn't know what to do next and kind of like trying to figure things out. And as I was sort of um, staring out the window, you know, as out of pure boredom, um, I noticed that these uh, went these um, uh, there was a some a repairmen that were um, doing some work on a window next door. And uh, what they were doing was they were scraping away um, or it had been paint on the front of the window and they were scraping away these layers of paint and revealing this absolutely um, beautiful um, cigar shop gilded sign. Um, and actually, this is a good, a good yeah, time show to tell. show you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's see but this. If, you, if you've kind of, this is what like um, gold leaf or real gold leaf sort of looks like. It's 23 karat um, leaves of actual gold that are laid onto the inside of the glass. So as they were scraping away these layers of paint, there's the incredibly beautiful um, sign was being revealed for a cigar company and sort of just got me thinking about that as an art form and uh, you know kind of got me curious about the the history of it and so that sort of led me down to the path to finding a um, the only all by hand sign shop that existed in San Francisco at the time uh, New Bohemia Signs um, and so, yeah, that one thing to let, I'll try not to ramble, so that, that's basically uh, sort of what began it all, my, you know, sort of self-discovery of this art form, which is, uh, took me till now, but I didn't realize <laughs> I'd be doing this for this long, but. I love that story. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and when we were talking about that, it, Meredith, you were remembering stories um, from your childhood, seeing some of your grandfather's signs around around your hometown. Do you want to talk about that and, and kind of where you, your early connections to sign painting? and? Yeah, um, so my grandfather was a sign painter in Watertown, Mass, right over there. Um, yeah, I, I, he was a sign painter, and um, I never really thought about it. Um, he passed away when I was 13, so I mean, I think most people, especially before they're teenagers, don't think about signs and you know look around. But my dad would always, um, when we would go to visit my grandparents, would always point out, "Oh, Papa did that bank over there," you know. Um, 
there were bingo signs that I specifically remember uh, my father pointing out. And it just was, you know, he, he was, it was, sign painting was kind of always there, but it wasn't really anything I ever paid attention to um, until I met Josh when I was 30. Um, and so when I f first met him, it kind of brought all this stuff back. I visited him at, um, we met in San Francisco, I visited <laughs> him at New Bohemia Signs where he worked, and I walked in the first time, and it just, it just smelled like my grandfather. It just brought everything back, and I have probably thought more about my grandfather in the last, <laughs> you know, decade than I ever did before. But, uh, but yeah, we went and visited um, the church that they went to in Watertown, and there's bingo signs that are hand painted. Um, we went in and talked to the um, maintenance person or whoever takes care of that kind of stuff, but he wasn't there at that time. He said they don't keep those kinds of records, and mm -hmm. so we don't have official confirmation that it's his, but I'm pretty sure that it's his sign. Yeah, I doubt yeah. they'd switch it out in yeah. the meantime. Yeah. Can, and can I, sorry, I can make one, one correction for the um, internet audience. Uh, New Bohemia was one of the only um, hand painted sign shops, not the only. So there were a few of them then. for you guys yeah. out there <laughs> that are counting. Correction score. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. That's great, um, Narayan. I'm sure you have a little bit of a different pathway leading up to coming to the Forbes collection here. Do you want to talk a little bit about your background and what drew you um, to where you are now? Yeah, sure. I have a background in chemistry and I did a, I was doing a PhD in chemistry at Melbourne University in Australia. And I heard on the radio, I used to be at the bench doing, you know, pouring things into flasks and Erl and Meyer beakers and things and listening to the radio and I, there was a, a story about the Dalai Lama <clears throat> who liked watching movies, but he had a limited access to spare parts for projectors in Tibet. And so what he did when the projector broke was pull it apart, worked out what was wrong, fixed it, put it back together again. And that idea of reverse engineering is something that really struck, struck me as like a very powerful way of understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up doing is reverse engineering paintings. Mm -hmm. And so I, what I do is look at paintings. I want to understand how the artist created that, that work, how it's painted, how it's made. <clears throat> the entire thought process, what goes into creating that, that work of art. And so to do that, you need a library of standards and the Forbes pigment collection is that library of standards. So I can analyze all the pigments that come out of it. I can have a, a conversation with the artist through their painting. And so that's, that's what I do. And it, for me, it's a, it's a very powerful way of understanding the art. And so that's, that's how I got into, into what I do now. It's, that's beautiful, and I think that idea of reverse engineering really resonated with you two, having to um, kind of come up with interesting new ways to approach uh, sign projects. Does that sound? <laughs> I think that that goes for everyone involved uh, in our field and probably many other fields, but it does, it, I guess that's the exciting part is that like every project is unique and there's a new sort of um, obstacle and a, a new sort of thing you've got to figure out and uh, do multiple Google searches on on how the t t correct type of paint and if it'll work, you know, <laughs> different uh, processes. And then also asking, um, we have, um, you know, there's there's many um, sign painting forums that you can ask questions and sort of that get get answers for various uh, problems that you have. But I think, um, yeah, I think it's a constant challenge of uh, figuring out um, what you're doing. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the Hamilton uh, Wood Type Museum, when I was speaking with the director uh, of that collection for this book, was saying that uh, there's just no manual for so much of what they do, and I think that goes for so many of the artists that. I interviewed too, and in addition to just testing and trying and failing and trying something different, um, there's a lot of research too, right, that goes into it. And I was speaking earlier about um, the, the ancient connections and the historical connections for so many of the artists. Um, I'd like to kind of hear a little bit about uh, how that history influences each of the work that you do. Um, and Meredith, I think you're especially conscious of the history of, of signs in, in the work, in any project that you take on um, in some of your projects outside of Best Dressed Signs. Do you wanna speak to a little bit of that? Um, sure, so um, 
I guess to um, to preface this is um, my background is actually in English literature, um, so I come to signs from um, the perspective of kind of semiotics and uh, how signs operate and um, how they kind of help us move through space and uh, and things like that. So um, uh, so my interest so I. Josh is the designer for Best Dress Signs, um, and I paint, but I don't do any of the design work. I don't really, uh, I'll do the lettering, but I don't design any of it. Um, so my focus um, outside of when we're actually painting signs to get paid uh, is um, we started this group called the Pre-Vinylite Society, which is a, um, it's kind of just a loose network of sign enthusiasts and people that are interested in the kind of um, aesthetics of our city spaces. Um, and we, uh, we curate art shows to do with signs and we've put out uh, the first issue of a journal, the Pre-Vine Light Society Journal, and I, I use that to kind of, to write and to like research. Um, so I'm interested in the history of signs um, specifically when they kind of made the shift, um, and I'm talking in the Western world because I don't have um, I don't have experience or knowledge of, um, of the signs in other parts of the world, but in the Western world specifically, England and America, um, the shift from when they changed from pictorial to lettering, um, because before sort of the late 18th century, most signs were pictorial because most people were illiterate. Um, and so there was a series of events that happened in London that led to um, the, a lot of the pictorial signs coming down. It coincided with a rise of li in literacy, and so that's when the kind of shift happened um, where signs became mostly letters um, instead of pictures. And so that's, that's kind of the aspect of sign history. I mean, there's lots of different, obviously, with any kind of history, you can kind of dig into specifics, but that's that's the aspect of it that's most interesting to me. Yeah, it's super, super fascinating. Um, and I think, Margaret, you can probably, that probably resonates a lot with you, um, just that deep history of handwriting. I won't ask you to, to give us a whole timeline of how that influences you, but do you have any thoughts on, on kind of the historical precedent for writing by hand every day and doing calligraphy um, as your profession, what, it, what that means to you? What happens is... I'm speaking to your it's microphone, Margaret. A little like having, there we go. <laughs> sorry, like having a good ear for music. Mm. You can never not see the pen that was behind any particular letter form that you're reading, and that includes drawn, like signage. That includes handwritten, and I, pretty much any script in the world. I can give you a good guess as to the kind of pen that wrote it and the kind of surface that it was written on, and especially for type. When I see type, I don't just see the type, I see the roots. Wow. To where that style of type came from and what they were aiming at when they designed it and what the designer of the piece is aiming at when they picked that type. You, there's just a lot more to the page than what you're seeing. Do you have a favorite? I like, well, you'd have to read my books, but I like Parker a lowercase Roman. Parker has written 19 Roman books, by the way. That um, is called Book Hand or Carolingian Minuscule or um, Book Antiqua on your computer. It's wider than Times Roman. Mm -hmm. And you're not so tired of it as people get of Times Roman. So you asked for a favorite. That's mine. Love that. Beautiful. Um, this morning, Narayan and I were, uh, pre we got to preview the uh, Forbes collection before uh, coming here today. And Narayan, you were talking to me about some of the oldest color examples. And I think you mentioned there is an ochre from 2, 4 BC? I'm getting yeah, that wrong. Something like that. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about some of those bygone color sources and yes, stories? Absolutely. So yeah. what I 
We do have some old pigments there that are from a uh, potter from about 2 to 4 BC. They're colours that are in it that were from an archaeological site and excavated. But I, I do like thinking about colour as being essential to everything that people do because you look at the very oldest works of art, the cave paintings, Australian Aboriginal um, rock art paintings, and there they have colour in them. So you've got people who are working very hard to survive and they still have enough time to find colour to use in the art that they're producing. Mm -hmm. So colour has been there not just 2 to 4 BC but 30 to 50,000 BC yeah. and that's amazing. It's like it's right there from the start and colour develops meanings as you move through time. So things like ultramarine blue was as expensive as gold in medieval times and used to paint virgins' robes, and if you were very pious, you would pay a lot of money for a lot of ultramarine to prove to the audience in the church just how pious you were. <laughs> um, if you were an important Roman senator, you would have Tyrian purple, which was made from shellfish mollusks. Oh, sorry, um, made from shellfish and the murex mollusk, and that would be used to dye your toga. If you're an emperor, you would use the same pigment. So purple became associated with the um, with empires and and, and a very you know, sort of a, a real sign of how status can be associated with a color. Amazing. Yeah. So you know every pigment has its own story in that that kind of regard, and then its own downfall. There was a synthetic version of ultramarine that came along in 1826, and that meant that ultramarine was no longer so valuable. Mm -hmm. um, William Perkin invented mauve in 1856, and so suddenly the late Victorian period was full of socially aspiring people using cheap purple. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah. pigments have got these amazing stories of, like, rise and fall, yeah. and, uh, you know, they, each pigment has its own story in that way. Stories upon stories. Um, I'm curious, uh, Meredith, from your perspective, uh, so in terms of semiotics and sign painting, Color means so much. Do you want to? Um, this is a side question that I didn't prep you with at all, but yeah. any ideas on how how you think about color? That's a really good question. I ha I've never really considered that. I guess because most of the historical, you know, obviously there's no um, there's no photographs of signs before, mm -hmm. you know, before photography, and then those are all black and white. So I guess I hadn't really. I hadn't really considered how color plays into it. Josh might have an idea on that. I'm, uh, not, not, necess not necessarily. Well, I, I suppose as far as like the sign trade goes, there was definitely like um, uh, not not going as far back as what Meredith is talking about, but maybe uh, more in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century or even up until now. Uh, thinking about um, colors that would, um, you know, you're thinking about how quickly you can produce a sign and because uh, time is money. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times um, you're making color considerations based on uh, how many coats it will take to, to, to cover uh, for a letter mm -hmm. and what different processes you can do. Um, like for, um, you know, if you ever see, um, signs painted, you'll see a lot of um, black and white mm -hmm. signs painted on on brick, um, some of those old signs that now are considered go ghost signs. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see um, some white lettering with black background, and a lot of times they would be cutting in around the letters instead of painting the white on top of the black so that the white is only one coat and the black is only one coat, so you're saving time in um, that process. So. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, uh, th these days, like, you know, we're we're like very colorful sign painters. Very, so, very <laughs> so we've yeah. kind of like, um, s you know, like we're not as traditional in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, and sometimes it does take a little bit longer. And also, you have to worry about um, things fading more, certain colors fading mm -hmm. quicker because it's exterior um, work. Um, but we're we're excited about just kind of pushing the as, as much bright and kind of like color and being very um, vibrant in our work. But mm -hmm. there is a, a whole sort of um, 
tradition of what colors were best used on signs and, and also for readability purposes. Um, if it's a highway sign versus um, a show card that was seen in the theater, um, in, the, in, the, in the mezzanine mm -hmm. of the theater, you can get away with certain colors versus you, what you can get away with on a, a freeway sign. Some practical considerations and yeah. context and location all come into play. Yeah. But you're definitely not at a loss for uh, choices for color these days. No. With all the <laughs> synthetic Which options. Is interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, the, and the, you know, the, the, you know, when they were grinding mm -hmm. their own uh, paints and making their own paints, and I mean, the, I mean, the, the toxicity level of it all is pretty um, something to consider, too. We what, saw a sample that just said poison yeah. on it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so I'm, I'm, pr I'm definitely glad we don't have to make our own paints at this point. So. <laughs> it would take a little bit more time than yeah. maybe you have time for <laughs> Yeah. <Yes. laughs> with how busy you guys are. Uh, before I move on to the next question, Margaret, how do you think about color when you uh, are working on a calligraphy project? That's a huge range of decisions, but um, I can say that when you're communicating with someone else, mm -hmm. say in a handwritten note or a, a uh, hand-designed page, you want to think about the reader as well as expressing who you are. And this used to be bound very tightly by etiquette. A lady would not use a certain color of ink mm. um, when she was writing a sort of impersonal note. There was a color of stationery for a good 50 years called Lincoln Blue because Abraham Lincoln had used it in the White House. <laughs> and people felt so strongly about him that they wanted to follow that lead. Um, think about writing to somebody with green or purple ink, even in this age of very free communication. You'd stop and think, now wait a minute, how seriously do I want to be taken? Um, I will not write to you in purple. Right, and <laughs> red, red ink has its own messages mm -hmm. to to mean you're spending too much money, or it used to mean this day in the calendar belongs to the saint. That's what a red letter day is. It's a saint's day in the list of the year. There are a lot of traditional, but then also a lot of gut level mm. reactions to color. Absolutely. Do you want to add to that? I actually just wanted to ask you a question. I. I know that blacks are not just blacks. Yeah. There's a whole range of subtlety inside that. And could you just talk a little bit about black ink? Because there's a lot of color in that. Yeah. There are two main kinds of black ink in Western calligraphy. The kind you use on parchment, and then the kind you use on paper. Parchment ink has to have iron and what's called oak gall in it because parchment is slightly oily. It's made from skin and it never quite loses that. Mm -hmm. So it has to bite into the surface in order not to kind of bead up and eventually just flake off. Mm -hmm. If you write with that ink on paper, it will still bite in and it'll bite right through. And eventually you'll have a hole where you wanted to have a letter on the paper. Um, paper is better with sepia ink, which I'm sure you know is made from cephalopods or squid. And when it fades, it has a brown tone. But those are the two main kinds of black. Then 20th century, all bets are off. You know, it's, it's <laughs> acrylic, it's got all other kinds of, of ingredients. But those two, you can usually tell. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. That's Good. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah, OK. Absolutely. Um, I think we've done some really good table setting here um, to sort of tackle the question of all questions, which this book is sort of approaching. What do we really lose if one of your art forms goes away? Um, I'd like to hear from each of you kind of about your own practice or more generally 
And um, maybe Josh and Meredith, we can start with you. If sign painting, ha painting by sign or painting signs by hand goes away, and everything goes to vinyl printing, which has happened in in this industry, so that's you've had some sort of ups and downs. Um, do you want to give us a little sense of that history and where you see things? Um, well, the as far as I know, and, and again, I'm kind of more of a um, 18th century, <laughs> but uh, as far as I know from just sort of uh, people who are in the field that have lived through um, the kind of vinyl takeover, um, the I think it was probably around the 70s, like late 70s, 80s, um, when vinyl technology started really taking hold and um, you know, you could have no experience, no um, no training, no knowledge of design, no anything. You just buy uh, one of these machines, open a sign shop, and produce, you know, more for less. And uh, a lot of people um, who had been sign painters for decades were um, either put out of business or had to adapt or um, some some of them just kept doing what they're doing and were either lucky or um, innovative enough or um, you know pulled through or did both or or also bought a vinyl machine and um, and incorporated that into their practice um, so that that happened and basically the 80s and 90s were um, not as hand painted, the sign industry was not as, as hand painted as uh, it was before. And then in the last, um, I don't know, what would you say, 15 years or so, there's been a, a great resurgence. Um, it's kind of ironic that it was the, it was really the, um, it was really technology that brought back the resurgence of the hand painted um, signs because the internet really brought a lot of people together and brought a lot of um, um, older sign painters together with younger sign painters. And there was a lot of learning that happened. They look great on Instagram internet. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Colorful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's been a great resurgence in the last, definitely the last decade. Um, and so we can kind of, I mean, we can kind of see what I mean, it's basically exactly the premise of your book, that it was almost lost and it's it's been really revived um, in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, depending on who you're asking. Um, you guys have been but, busier than ever before, right? You're getting all kinds yeah. of uh, gigs and projects. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's definitely something that people are still valuing, which is amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, um, this is kind of... Um, what we often say, but um, it's, you know, people do find the beauty in sort of this hand, you know, I think we're all gonna say the same thing, but <laughs> I think people do see the, 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 the beauty in, in, in the handmade object and um, sort of that beauty in the, the flaw of that object and what makes that, you know, unique and special and so human um, compared to something that is almost perfect and um, which, you know, something that was created by a computer and made by a computer uh, or a machine. Um, and that's, that's not to say that we don't think that the machines like serve a purpose or have, have a purpose, um, but I think when you can take a moment to enjoy something hand created um, and you can, the oddities of it that, that, that stand out, I think are what are, are so fascinating and interesting sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, with Boston um, becoming every single building is, you know, uh, you know, uh, just one down the street here <laughs> being torn down and who knows what's going to come back up. But the problem that we find is that, um, and, every, and a lot of people I'm sure find, is that when it does come back up, it doesn't look much different than what it probably did on the computer screen when they mm -hmm. were designing it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you know, um, a little bit lifeless in, in that way. Um, and we sort of miss seeing some of those flaws that are uh, unique to handmade yeah. Um, objects. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Narayan, you, we were looking at all these different labels in the Forbes Pigment Collection. It just shows this tremendous color history 
and the way that certain colors have come in and out of out of fashion, technologies come and go for various reasons. But what what's kind of your take on this question? So I, <clears throat> what, what what I think is that the scientists who work in museums help us discover what was lost and what we didn't know. So there are colors like lead tin yellow that were disappeared in about 1750 and was rediscovered in 1940. Mm -hmm. And so for hundreds of years, people didn't know what they were missing. And then it became apparent. And so now you look at older paintings and you go, that's lead tin yellow, that very, very bright yellow beading around here. It's, it's, it's what it was and we didn't know that. Um, another example is lead tin antimony yellow. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Horacio Gentileschi's painting of the lute player in the National Gallery in Washington, um, the figure is wearing this bright yellow dress and it, we didn't know what it was until 1997 when two of my colleagues rediscovered this pigment. Oh. And so now we know and we can say, oh, that slightly browny yellow colour is that pigment and it really gives meaning to what's going on. And, you know, these, these pigments that were used by artists keep on getting rediscovered. So Vivianite, which grows around bones, is a purple pigment. It was rediscovered by Marika Spring not that long ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and metallic bismuth. That was this weird-looking shiny paint. Nobody quite knew what it was, and then Marika was able to work out what it was. And so now we have this understanding of these artists who are experimenting and trying out new things that sort of worked but have been forgotten about, and so we're rediscovering and re-honouring what artists were doing. Mm. And... We just keep on doing that. So what we have is, you know, artists who are trying out stuff gets forgotten about and now we're able to bring it back. And it is, you know, rediscovering lost lost pigments. And it's, it's an important part of understanding the evolution of how we got to where we are now. Yeah. And I think the collection, the work that you do, it all keeps telling those stories and keeps us talking about it and, and wanting to learn more. Um, before we open up for audience questions, I want to hear from Margaret because we were talking a lot before um, this event about just how sad it is that just the act of handwriting a note to one another has has gone so far away. But your your mission is to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, I'll I'll answer that in two pieces. One is that I don't think calligraphy is going away. Mm -hmm. If it was going to, it would be far gone because there are so many substitutes for it. But people love how it looks and they love to do it themselves. Handwriting is another item. And yet, I would say this is one of the most irresistible pieces of paper with ink on it, a note in your mail, handwritten by somebody whose handwriting you recognize, and I always call it a, a gift-wrapped communication. There's that moment of anticipation when you think, oh, I wonder what she's going to say. And I always like to point out, it's the, uh, the only other ink on paper that really makes people sit up is U.S. <laughs> currency, but I can't say that anymore soon. Um, but I want to point out that if you give a donation to the Peabody Museum, you will most likely get a handwritten note from the development officer. They know which side their bread is buttered on. <laughs> you will get handwritten notes from a lot of organizations that you work for or donate to. Um, there is still a lot of room for people to say thank you, to say I'm sorry, mm -hmm. to say I sympathize, to say congratulations. You don't have to buy a $40 bouquet of roses or a $25 bottle of wine. This is the best show of friendship that you can give anybody. And I think people are hanging on to that. Every year they say, oh, it's a dying art, it's a lost art. Almost. And it, my publisher yeah, just reprinted a book of mine called The Art of the Handwritten Note. 
They issued a fresh new design with a new um, introduction because they see that 20 years after it first came out and everybody said, oh, that's a dying art, it's still here it's and still here. it still communicates. That's beautiful. Thank you so Could, much. Yeah. I, I just want to put in my word as well. I've been writing to a friend in Melbourne for 30 years now, handwriting, and we write a couple of times a month. Yep. And it's an amazing experience, sitting down, writing, yep. and it mm -hmm. slows you down. It's not like that hunt and peck like tick, 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 on a keyboard. You're actually writing something, and it, it forces you to think what you're about to say. And it's a pleasure mailing it, and it's a pleasure knowing that something's coming as well. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm so glad to hear that. I always say that stroking is a better way to put ink on the paper than pounding. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Final thoughts from anybody before we turn it over to audience questions? Any questions from the audience that I can take? We have some mics over here. Question down here. Hello. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask if there is a particular um, work of art in your fields that uh, you came across, uh, each of you, that uh, inspired you or you thought was particularly noteworthy. Uh, some, from another artist or a particular piece of chemistry or pigment that intrigued you, a story from your field. So I'm, I'm going to say that every time I begin examining a work of art, I leave having greater respect for that artist. Even if it's someone who I didn't necessarily care for to start with, I end up leaving going, that person really knew what they were doing. They weren't doing this by accident. They were talented, they were making really deliberate choices, and now I understand what those choices are. So if you ask me if there's one, I'll say no, I'll say it's every time. Meredith or Josh? Um, for me, it was um, William Hogarth's Beer Street. Um, <laughs> William Hogarth was a, uh, an 18th century um, engraver and illustrator, and he did um, he did drawings of contemporary city life in London. And uh, this one particular, um, I'm gonna, I keep wanting to say painting, it's not a painting, it's an engraving. Um, he features a sign painter. And that was kind of the, when I first saw that, it kind of kicked off my whole um, historical sign interest. Um, the sign painter in the painting is, um, he is well. The the, the it's, I keep saying painting. It's an engraving. Um, the the scene is of um, it's it's a companion piece with another um, engraving called Gin Alley or Gin Lane, um, and it's sort of about how uh, gin is really bad and beer is better. So gin has all these you know horrible things. There's like babies falling out of their mother's arms and people getting killed and you know all sorts of stuff bad stuff happening. And then Beer Street is like this image of uh, um, you know, like abundance and happiness and stuff. But the sign painter in Beer Street, um, he's painting a gin bottle and he is all um, ragged. His clothes are all torn up. And, um, and so it kind of, it, it led me to question like why he was depicted in that way. And then that just was the rabbit hole that led me down the path of researching signs from the 18th century. Uh, for me, I think it was um, uh, when I was younger, I was really interested in uh, pop, uh, pop art and uh, particular uh, James Rosenquist, um, mm -hmm. who was like a signed painter when he, before he was famous in New York painting billboards and how that sort of played into how his later paintings, um, uh, how he depicted his later paintings and how he was, how he, he, he told the story about how um, when he'd be painting these large billboards in uh, New York City above, like Times time Square, that he'd only he'd be he could, on a um, on a swing stage or a scaffolding, you can only get so far from a, from a painting. And so, when you are looking at what is an advertisement from far away, it looks like more of an abstract, you know, piece of art up close. 
And um, I always thought that was really interesting. I think I was dr drawn to that from an early age and also like Andy Warhol, very like, um, you know, that whole like um, uh, art sort of derived from like com commercial art. Um, and so I think that's sort of what kind of captured me early on. And I'm still very interested in early um, commercial art and those sort of um, very hard, hard edged and really um, line oriented artworks. Um, so, yeah. And speaking of um, handwritten notes, I just heard this the other day that the billboard painters would um, leave little messages for each other yeah. because whoever would come in next would, you know, they'd have to paint it out white and repaint the whole thing. So I just heard that just the other day. Oh, that's, that's really terrific. interesting. That's really cool. I'm going to find a way to put that in a book. Yeah. Yes, I'll try to it. find where I, where I yeah. saw that. Yeah. Cite your source. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, I'm going to split this into two. One would be in uh, studying and writing about Chinese calligraphy uh, and Japanese calligraphy. I discovered there's a whole subgenre where you just, with a brush, make a circle. Yeah. And I devoted a whole page to it in one of my books. And there was one guy who made circles on bed sheets hanging on the wall so that he would throw the ink to make the circle. Um, and then some people will just do it as meditation. And I've got several of those I treasure. The other thing is, and I think you can all identify with this, for handwriting, now and then I come across in my files a letter from my mother, mm -hmm. who's been gone 30 years now. And it's still, it gives me that same thrill of the morning mail, which is, oh, look at that. She's right here. And so I think when people truly accept that it's a way of making yourself present long after you're gone, it might inspire them to do a little more writing on paper. And I mean, you now, with your friend, have a treasure trove that really I mean, it, it, it would make a great book. I'm not sure about Do you want to take that, that one? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, Giotto, also the Italian painter, drew a circle and won an art competition for doing that. Yeah. So there's, there's no end of these. You know, circle is such a powerful, powerful statement. Yeah. Narayan, do you have a favorite art piece that... I, I really think whatever I'm working on at that time is what I care most about. <laughs> and so... I feel that too. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, like when I was working on the Rothko murals for the opening of the art museums, that I was so passionate about Mark Rothko at that moment. And at the moment, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at Philip III of Spain, painted by um, Pantoja de la Cruz. And that's from 1605, and I'm really passionate about that. So it's... You know, these, these projects bring me into a whole other world and so I, I just immerse myself in that and I, I love it. But I, I wanted to ask the sign writers, Ed Ruscha is another person who comes oh, yeah. to mind and I don't know if he's someone, Definitely. he paints and paints letters and invents his own um, font and everything. I mean, is that, is that someone who you're aware uh, of? Absolutely, yeah, that's one of the, one of the names, um, one of the, the artists that I was really drawn to early on, especially like the standard like mobile like um, painting with just those hard lines, like just the very graphic sort of nature of it. And because um, I think that um, sign painting is often, you know, it's very graphic. And um, I yeah. think, uh, so yes, definitely. And um, he's, um, he w wrote a foreword uh, not too long ago. There's a book called Sign Painters that came out um, years ago. And um, that, I think, helped also to uh, spark uh, some of this resurgence, but he wrote the foreword for that book, which is cool. <laughs> Could keep talking about artists all day. I'm gonna make sure yeah. that we can answer a few other yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. um, anybody um, Emily? else? Emily? Yes. What is your favorite uh, yeah. work of art? Oh, yeah. I'm sort of of the Narian camp, where it's really hard to choose at any given yeah. time, but I'm a very big Duchamp fan, so. I need to um, make it out to see more Duchamp in person, but uh, learning about 
the large glass as an undergrad was pretty impactful for me. <laughs> it's a very complicated um, piece, and I love the idea that he just had this joke that he wasn't telling anyone the punchline to for all of his work. It just keeps me endlessly fascinated as a researcher. <laughs> um, question, yes, go, go ahead. Yeah, Margaret. Um, in in uh, Western we calligraphy, fonts can evoke a period, you know, like the uh, Gothic font will evoke sort of, you know, medieval Germany, and the, you know, you get the West, Old West fonts that evoke, you know, the gunslingers in, in Arizona in the 1890s. Um, is that also true in, in Oriental calligraphy? Do you get the same, is there an evolution of the of the writing that uh, evokes a period? I'm not an expert enough. I, I'm not. <sighs> there are several self-consciously archaic, um, almost primitive scripts in Chinese and Japanese They're called oracle bone scripts mm -hmm. that are made, we would call them runes. They're made with straight lines that look like they've been kind of scratched into the surface of a stone or bone. I don't know enough to know what that means to a person from that country who looks at it. Sorry. <laughs> Take the next question, thank you so much. Um, I have a question I don't know if anyone can answer about um, something I was thinking about a few days ago, actually, about the semiotics of signs and color. I've just always been kind of curious. I mean, there are colors that we see all the time, red, green, and blue, uh, uh, sorry, red, green, and yellow for the stoplights. And also things like yield signs and caution things being yellow or bright orange. And I'm just kind of curious, like, when did all of that start, that it would be universal, that people would know red is stop and green is go and yellow means be careful or, you know, in those related colors? Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to answer that either because it's, uh, it's outside of my kind of, it, there, I mean, there's a, there's a whole field of, um, you know, wayfinding signs and there's probably sciences behind all of those choices that, um, yeah, are just kind of outside, um, definitely my realm of, of, uh, of interest in, in that kind of thing. It's, uh, sometimes it gets a little, um, you know, sign codes and all of that kind of stuff gets a bit too technical for me to research. Um, it's very good but question, it's a great then. question. Yeah. And I'm sure there, I'm, I'm, there is an answer, um, that, I'm sure it has to do with, uh, you know, whatever research they've done on how people react to different colors. Um, but yeah, it's, it's beyond my scope of there may, research. There may possibly Ryan? be someone. Uh, do you, do you have an yeah. answer? So I, I was going to say that there are people who've tried to assign emotions and responses to very specific colors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like the Blue Rider School, they, you know, Kandinsky and Mark, um, Franz Mark tried to assign emotions to colours, but they ended up with their own specific codes and they didn't correlate at all. I think, I seem to remember that with stoplights and what, that, that kind of stuff with um, street signs, that it started to evolve and there wasn't a single code at first, and then it slowly started to evolve and you know, there'd be things like semaphore signals that would come out with words written on them. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of, uh, stop and go is something that evolved and became codified, but I, I don't know exactly how that happened. There were, I saw a great episode of um, Top Gear where one of the, the um, people interviewed the woman who invented the, all the motorway signs that you see in England, and she's still around and she is able to talk in a very articulate way about all the decision-making that went into the font the arrows, the colour, all of that stuff. So that happened by the government saying we need this for the motorways. And so that, that's where we, that's how we got there. At a certain point, I 
and I don't want to say which year it was, but it happened, and I, I suspect that there are stories like that about yeah. street lights, about the font that's used for street signs, all of those things that I think government initiatives are, are probably to blame for all of it. Yeah, but you don't think that colors are, like, like you were talking about the purple being royal and, and those kind of things, you don't, there isn't any kind of like historical association between green and go and red and stop or that you know of? I, I don't know of anything. There, there may be someone typing right now on the live uh, feed that will answer that <laughs> <Seriously>? question. <laughs> so. I love that question, though. And, and yeah. um, Meredith, you were talking about the time before um, literacy was commonplace, so signs needed to be as simple and easy to understand as possible. And I'm sure that would include color. I'm just making an inference. but Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and as far as I know from my research of that era, mm -hmm. things like that came about sort of as as they were needed like i don't like um like the numbering system came into like started being becoming implemented around the same time that the pictorial signs were coming down and and uh lettered signs were being put up um and and that kind of happened like as as the signs were going out of disrepair or as they were they were actually in London falling down and killing people and so um, you know they had the city made didn't had an ordinance where they had to the projecting signs had to be replaced with signs affixed to the fronts of the buildings and things like that um, as far as I know from that era things sign ordinances happened as things led to them and I don't know of any kind of uh, meeting or anything where anybody sat down and decided we're gonna redo everything or, or come up with these colors that are gonna represent these things. I've, I've never come across anything like that but I also, you know, I, I haven't gotten into the sort of nitty gritty of sign codes and things like that. More so. stories to uncover. Do we, Diana, do we have time for one more question do you think? No, we gotta wrap it up. One more, one more? Yeah, let's do it. One more? Down here. Great. Wait for a mic. We got a mic for you right there at your shoulder. Oh. <coughs> Not good with these. Um, <laughs> could any of you talk more about the meditation impact of slow, deliberate practices, the ways in which you can get surprised into stillness by your own process? I'm thinking of once when I was in the scriptorium at Mont Saint-Michel and the absolutely pervasive stillness of that place um, just it infused the atmosphere even hundreds of years later. When I'm painting signs, it's uh, really the only time my mind ever stops. It's the only time that I'm not constantly thinking and yeah. when we're painting because I sp specifically mostly work on kind of large-scale um, on-site murals and so we'll often be on ladders um, and I've been talking recently about how it's it's almost like it's almost like yoga in the mm -hmm. sense that because it's not just my hand painting it's my other hand holding the cup which is very easy to, you know, your, your brush stroke is going like this and your paint cup goes with it. Um, so you have to be aware, even though you're not like actually using it, you're not focusing, your brain isn't focusing on it. You have to be aware of the cup in your hand. You have to be aware of your body standing on the ladder, balancing on the ladder. Um, and you have to focus on painting you know, whatever you're painting in front of you. So it, it, it's a very meditative and, and like oh, uh, kind of a whole body experience mm -hmm. for, for me when I'm doing that kind of work. Margaret? I would support that. Mm -hmm. Speaking very to the mic. similar to the experience of sitting yeah. in a chair, holding still, stopping talking, stopping listening. Margaret, your mic. And just focusing on the ink that's coming out of the pen. Yeah. There's a saying from scriptorium the hand writes but the whole body hurts 
because, I'm sorry, the whole body hurts because just holding still mm -hmm. is the hardest exercise there is. And I think everybody who works with lettering or has to hold still goes through a period of some months when they go full time and they just ache all over. Yeah. I, I have a similar experience too. I have to, part of my job is taking minute samples from works of art and I have to focus and everything has to be exactly right. I have to be in, in the zone. If I'm thinking about anything else other than what is directly in front of me, it just doesn't work. So I have to empty my brain and be focused on what I'm seeing down the microscope, tip of the scalpel, and that's it. Nothing else matters. I found, and interestingly enough, a similar thing with me, especially working on gold leaf or something really delicate um, in timing out your kind of heartbeats and your rhythm of your heart. Um, but I have found that listening to heavy, heavy metals uh, helps <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, gold leaf is a is a um, is a very specifically delicate like material for sign painting because it's uh, the the leaf itself is um, I don't know very 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 thin. I don't know how many millimeters, but very very thin, and so your breath can affect it. Wow. Um, and uh, as well as all sorts of other things it's in the environment. That push and pull and, you need. And gold is a heavy metal. <laughs> there you go. That's the perfect note to end this on, I think. <laughs> it's perfect. Thank you, Thank you everybody. <laughs>